Welcome to Business Spotlight. My name's Gary Crosby. I'm here this morning with uh, Louis Fairfax. He's the Managing Director of Cub UK, and I'm not going to tell you anything more about that. Uh, I'll let Louis do that. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning, Louis. No problem. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so let's start with a bit of context. We'll keep it nice and simple. Who are you? What do you do? How long have you been doing it? Sure. So I'm Louis Fairfax. I'm Managing Director of, of Cub UK. Um, I run a small family energy consultancy business and we are in the business of helping other businesses consume less power and gas and indeed purchase their gas and electricity contracts more effectively and more recently we've been involved with some clever schemes that the likes of National Grid have put in place to help balance the electricity system so may have seen in the headlines on you know various news outlets that um, the uh, electricity system's short in sort of peak time. So we've been helping customers to help the grid and in turn help themselves by generating some revenue by doing that. Yeah. Good stuff. And, and what's the current state of the energy market? I mean, everyone's been, you know, paying a lot more for their energy. Are we seeing that peaking and it's starting to come down? What should we expect in the rest of 2023? Yeah, so the market has gone through uh, unprecedented times over the last sort of two, two and a half years yeah. on the back of um, restrictions with COVID bringing energy prices down to record lows at various different points. Electricity prices were actually negative, so people were being paid to, to use yeah. power um, all the way through to... Uh, sort of back end of last year, European supply crunch, so there wasn't enough gas and electricity kicking around. Yeah. And um, and then obviously the uh, situation, uh, awful situation in Ukraine, which has resulted in record highs. So we've kind of seen the best and the worst of the market over yeah. that period of time. And what that's done to people's bills is uh, send them through the roof from uh, the point that they were probably paying the, the lowest price they paid over the last sort of five or 10 years. Uh, mm. due to the COVID situation to to now at a point where we have a customer that had to unfortunately just to, due to timing sign right at the top of the market and they're paying 100 pence per kilowatt hour which wow. is an astronomical amount yeah, yeah. That, um, you know they were, they were coming off a contract that was about 15 pence on average um, <clears throat> so now the market has actually started to, to come off quite quite substantially, um, mainly driven by we've had quite a mild winter. Mm -hmm. the, the prices are heavily influenced by the by the weather, the supply yeah. and demand sort of fundamentals, and then we've got a, a better outlook for for the next winter because of that. And indeed, we've um, We've got a, a good sort of pipeline of uh, gas coming in from from uh, various different sources for LNG, so it's shipped around mm. the world on big tankers. So yeah. for a, a business that's signed at the top of the market, coming back to the market now, you could expect to see prices in the region of kind of, I'd say, 30 to, to 40p would be a sort of normal electricity price I'd hope to see. So it just right. gives you some idea of, of where we are and what's happened. Mm. Mm. And do you get any sense that there's a kind of a, I don't know, it'd be too tough to call it a decentralization of power generation, but we're starting to see now people wanting to generate more power at home and the rise of renewable energy and the heat pumps of various kinds. How's that going to affect the market, do you think, as people start to generate power you know, on their own property, if you like? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a huge uh, shift in, in the market. And, and you're absolutely right. It's a um a, a growing area of uh of the, of the business um for us and indeed you know that there's there's whole businesses that are sort of starting up just to focus on answering the question about that decentralization mm -hmm. as well as behind the scenes the likes of Ofgem, national grid and all the uh, operators of the local distribution networks having to figure out what that smart grid kind of mm -hmm. looks like um mm -hmm. And a part of that is the, the work that I mentioned at the, at the top of the uh, interview. So we believe, and, and I firmly believe, and I'm quite passionate about the, the kind of DSR piece. So that's demand side response, mm -hmm. which 
you, you may not have heard that term before, but you'll hear a lot more about it in the future. And that is allowing and um, incentivizing consumers, whether that's a business or a domestic consumer, to to realize that they are as, as much of a part of that generation and, and, and supply picture yeah. and, and demand picture as, as the national grid is. So using any flexibility that a business has within their usage um, and, and, and being able to commercialize that is, is a yeah. big part of what we do. So to bring that to life a little bit, I look after a, a herb grower based in Lincolnshire mm -hmm. um, and they have uh, the sort of equivalent of a, a few hundred homes, you know, draw on their power through yeah. their light and heat that they need for the herbs. But they can obviously turn that off at, at the flick of a switch. Mm. So when the national grid need that power uh, at, peak, at peak times or the local distribution network operator need that power, they can reduce and, and effectively get paid for the amount of power they produce by. Mm. And if everyone's doing that, albeit at a smaller scale at home or, you know, the, 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 within the business, if there's any capacity to reduce at those times, yeah. there's commercial benefit in doing that. And that should far outweigh the issue around having to bring more gas fire power stations on board. And mm. indeed, you may have seen we were, uh, National Grid were asked to potentially start a couple of coal fire generation yeah. facilities up over winter. So... Yeah, really where, where I'm going with that in summary is there's a huge growth area for, for decentralized power. Uh, everyone needs to strongly consider if they've got the investment potential to, mm. to do that. And if, if they mm. have, we firmly recommend that businesses are uh, self-sufficient. And if they're not, is there any other way they can take part? And that's the sort of thing that we help businesses try and understand. Uh, on their path to net zero as well to got kind of tick that box up but yeah we've got, an, we've got another challenge coming there haven't we yeah indeed so um i mean looking at uh cub i did a bit of research obviously before we talked and uh, it's been in business now for what 25 years yeah it's actually um it'll be coming up to 30 years so i probably need to update some of my marketing the <laughs> website's actually uh something yeah. that we're going to be looking at to, to sort of refresh over the next couple of uh couple of months um yeah, yeah. as ever in a business that's the way isn't it you've got to kind of mm. keep fresh and within a, a few years it's out of date but yeah the um business has been around 30 years um it's actually my grandfather that started the company mm -hmm. so uh we've um we've kept that kind of family ethos i think in terms yeah. of how we do business and i'm quite proud to say that the core of our business the kind of legacy customers if you like we've mm -hmm. dealt with for you know 30 years 29 okay. 25 yeah. sort of years um yeah. and those, those businesses we dealt with uh, started where we, where we started was in sheffield and um we've got a good sort of core business there at so much so we need a face-to-face -face account manager still based in Sheffield to service those customers wow. whereas we're based down in March in Cambridgeshire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And business success, I mean, is a, it's a combination of, of many, many factors. Um, what do you think is the most important when it comes to building a successful business that's got longevity? I think it's knowing what you do well. That's, the, I know that's quite a sort of fluffy answer, really, Gary. But for me we so we went through a process a couple of years ago we restructured the business quite a painful process and we and we had to uh, to let some staff go yeah um and after that we we refocused our efforts towards you know what is it that our customers enjoy about cub what is it that we do well mm. um and indeed f for me personally it was then what's the aim of the business as a whole. So I think yeah. sometimes through um, growth ambitions or through uh, um, almost a, a, the feel of a necessity to, to, to continue on that growth path, people can get a little bit lost with actually what is it that, that makes that company unique? Because there's always something, otherwise people wouldn't carry on doing business with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for us, it was going back to basics and saying, well, we're a family business. We, we we look after clients and make ourselves invaluable, I guess, to, mm -hmm. to that kind of business. So mm. without going to too, too much depth, in our market, there's something like a thousand other brokers and, cons and consultants that operate yeah. in, our, in our space, in our sector. 
Yeah. Now, most of those, and if any, um, if you've got any experience or you know anyone with experience of a broker or consultant, there's many people that haven't had a great one, if I'm totally honest. It's quite <laughs> transactional. Yes. Um, it's very, you know, th th they'll get an offer from Eon and sign them up for 12 months and wave goodbye. And the offer might not be what it was. There's some people that do a great job out there, but I think what we always hear and the, you know, the feedback we get from customers is that we're easy to do business with and right. we look after them, they trust us. So let's focus on those sort of core benefits that we deliver to customers um, and, and actually nothing else. And then the rest pretty much takes care of itself because if you always bring it back to that focus, it, it, it works. And so far, so good, it has worked. <laughs> I mean, that's a, a that's a good point, because I, I do find a lots of business owners that I coach, they are distracted by shiny objects, you know, and something else mm. comes in and suddenly they're adding another thing to the portfolio or they're branching out into a new market and they become distracted from their core role. And it's very difficult to get back to it because you've built teams and things like that. Um, so there, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, and I was looking at your Meet the Team page and I could see all these people. I could see your granddad and your mum and your dad and... The rest of the team there, and I'm thinking you've been the managing director now, what, for 17 or 18 years? Oh, no, I don't think it's quite as much as that, but it's getting on there. Um, it was 2012, so we just don't know, about 11 years um, that I've, I've ran the business. Um, right. I was made a director 2009, though, so I was a sales director at that point. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's been a, been a few years now. Yeah. So when you think about your own leadership style and you think about building up a high performing team, people who come to work and they're engaged and they're doing that, what's the what's the key, do you think, for, for that as you build a high performing team? Um, I think what's worked with with Cub and we, as I mentioned, we went through a restructure what was that, 2017, so what's that, six years ago now? Yeah. Um, we have maintained that the, the same num number of staff and the same staff members since that restructure. Um, right. And most of those guys worked with us prior to that as well. So I think the average sort of length of service within the team is probably about seven or eight years. Right. Um, Good. And that, and that speaks volumes for me around, you know, that, that we, we must be doing something right. Um, <laughs> but to put my finger on exactly what that is, it's probably quite difficult actually, but I think that it, we've taken them along with us. And, and for me, and that doesn't work for every business, but for me, I've been quite open with, look, you know, this is where we are. When we restructured, mm. this, is the, this is the reason why, this is the gap, this is the hole, this is what we need to fill. Yeah. Um, and we had an uphill battle, Gary, to, to manage our way and sell our way almost out of a, a problem. Yeah. And, and we yeah. did it within about three or four months, where we, we thought it was going to be more of a three or four year journey to, to mm. get there. Um, yeah. And then from there, the, the team have seen a con considerable increase in their salary in return for that. So th th there's been nothing groundbreaking that I've done, um, that, but I think that I've very much kind of taken them along on the mm. journey with us. And the team, are so passionate about delivering delivering on that kind of ethos that, that, that I hold you know for the business that they can almost manage themselves you know mm. that I trust them implicitly to manage the customer relationships as if they're, they're their own customers and it's their own business and I feel like they feel like that their portfolios almost are um so uh, yeah, there's. does that answer the question? <laughs> it does. It does because you know there's a lot of debate, isn't there, now around you know what is it that motivates people? Can they yeah. see the path that they're on inside the business that they work for? Do they feel valued? Have they got some autonomy? Are they working on something that's you know <clears throat> stretching for them and they're becoming good at it and they can feel yeah. that? Um, so there are lots of different aspects there. But no, I, I absolutely get that. So. I mean, looking at the broader marketplace, obviously you speak mm. to a lot of different businesses and, and different types of client for you, as, as do I in the coaching business. What, what do you think the main challenges are that businesses are facing just at the minute? I, I mean, we hear it from pretty much every quarter at the moment, and it's it, not only energy costs, but the, the, the cost base across the mm. board has increased so substantially that there are many businesses just sort of hanging on for dear life. So I think... That, that is a headline, it's it's that cost base um, and everyone just scratching their head around what they do about that and trying to justify and um, 
getting to the point where the customers, their customers can absorb that cost increase that they need to pass on in order yeah. to stay in business and to carry on supplying them with goods and services. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, energy prices coming off, that's going to help. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll see the, the, the effect on that in terms of uh, the inflation numbers and what have you, I'm sure, over the next few months. Um, so there's a, a, a big sort of light at the end of the tunnel. But yeah, yeah the headline is for me, it's been painfully uh, difficult to have those conversations around, okay, you've got, you know, got cost base increasing everywhere. And now here's a 200% increase in your energy costs and that's the best Absolutely. that we're able to get for you from the market that's been quite a difficult conversation yeah yeah i mean it, it is interesting and what's what's uh caught my eye as i've been talking to my different clients is these kind of micro climates of inflation you know so mm -hmm. yeah inflation's running at 10 percent, but my construction client is saying building materials have gone up by 33 percent and suddenly yeah. you've got different types of inflation which is mm -hmm. uh quite a challenge so yeah yeah. So where are you looking to take Cub uh, in the next few years? What's the, what's the vision for, for the company? Um, without sort of copping out too much, it's more of the same really, Gary. And, and I, get, I guess it, that goes back to what I was saying in terms of our success. Um, mm. I, I've not set out on any kind of growth plan. We've got no formal strategy around what the future looks like. However, mm. um, we've found ourselves operating quite squarely in this demand side response market. Um, we're the only consultant in the market, only sort of TPI, if you like, that have, um, they're an approved provider through National Grid for the latest scheme that, that we operated over winter. Yeah. And I've actually just agreed some numbers with the customer to bid for their flexibility with um, demand side response at a local level through UK power networks. Mm. So without getting too technical, which I'm a little bit there, um, <laughs> it, it's behind. about moving with the, the um, moving with the market, looking at what's next. And in our space, that's very much this smart grid piece. Um, mm. Mm. And that's very much where I feel that we need, we need to be able to add benefit to our clients and, and there's value in, and the commercial opportunity for us there as well. Mm. So that sounds to me like, you know, solid organic growth. You're not setting out to be the, the 20 million pound company or the 50 million pound company. It's just like, no. we keep doing well what we're doing at the minute and we'll watch the growth tick up as, as time goes on. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And really, I don't want to grow in terms of headcount. You know, we're, we're very much about, yeah. uh, we've maintained that staff level since 2017. I, I don't really want that to change. Um, simply because I don't want our customers to suffer at the hands of our growth ambitions mm. and therefore I'd sooner be clever about what we do and be more efficient in what we do than, than take on members of staff. Since we restructured we've grown the business by 50-60% in terms of uh, turnover but we've kept that, that number the same in terms of headcount so wow. we, you know, we, we, we've done something right there. Um, mm. And then long, long term, um, again, going back to the ethos of the business, um, I'm uh, fortunate enough or unfortunate at times when it's half term and what have you to, to have uh, three little lads that run about this place. Um, yeah. And the, the plan for me and therefore for the business long term is that they will have the opportunity and they'll start from the bottom just as I did to, yeah. uh, to, to, to get involved with the business in the future. Um, Fabulous. And, and it's a, a long-term plan. So then it's what, what do I need to do to fit around that to make that happen? Mm -hmm. And any major obstacles ahead, do you think, or challenges for, for the business? Do you think there's yeah. a kind of disruptor or you know, black swan type event? Sure, yeah. There's um, certainly a push from the market to an extent and off-gem for, for tighter regulation in our, in our market. Um, mm. And that's having some customers look at how a, a third party intermediary such as ourselves, a broker or consultant operate. For us, that's probably an opportunity actually in many ways, but it's certainly a big, um, a big yeah. change. Um, so predominantly with our customers, we will present 
a set of offers to a client and we include a commission and we're happy to declare what that is it's, it's not hidden we don't say our service is free mm. that's just how we do business there are, uh, are other people in the market that have not been quite as open and transparent shall we say around right. what that number is and and, and how that works um so Offgem are putting pressure on the suppliers to ensure they're only doing business with with uh, you know reputable outfits and ones which tick all the boxes in terms of compliance. So, so yeah, maybe in some short, accreditation on. coming or some kind of something no. more strict in terms of you know licensing to become a broker and that sort of thing. Yeah, not at the at the sort of larger level, but there's a change that's come in to protect micro businesses more recently. So we've had to register through um, the, the ADR scheme, they termed it. So right. it's, a, it's a redress scheme that ensures that if a micro business complains about their consultant or broker or supplier, yeah. that there's a, a forum and a, and a, and a procedure yeah, yeah. To, to sort of carry that out, which again, we fully support and, it, and, it, and we're on board with. Uh, and, and again, I think for us, it's probably an opportunity the majority of our clients though aren't micro businesses we do have yeah i'd say 20 percent maybe of, of our customers are micro businesses but uh the majority of our clients are sort of mid to mid to large market customers mm -hmm. so let's just uh, as we're coming towards the end but let's just reflect on the whole business journey and it's uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's a bit of a contrived question but i still like asking it because in my mind, there's that moment when you look back across your business journey, and I imagine you, you know, going back to talk to your younger self. What what piece of advice would you give your younger self now, with all of these years of experience that you've got in in business? Sure, uh, I, th I think it would be not to overthink things, um, yeah. and nice. probably trust your trust your instincts a little bit, and to, to bring that to life a little bit. I think. I keep talking about this restructure, but I think it was a pivotal moment in the business and the success that we've, we've now mm. found ourselves enjoying. And prior to that, we, we were, we were quite focused on growth and we were quite focused on a, we were almost quite corporate. You know, we, we had a mm. very different approach to doing business and it just didn't feel right for me. Um, mm. And what I found myself doing is managing a business where, you know, I was managing a, a team of, a team of people and, and, and not actually interacting with clients and not yeah, actually yeah. Um, understanding really what was going on at the, at the bottom end of the business, even at, you know, the size that we were, we were at the time, or well, the height of number of employees was only 27. But even at that size, I was finding that I was just too disconnected from it and it just didn't feel right. Um, so, yeah, I think it's if for any, especially a business owner that started a company, mm you've got to look back at the reasons that you started it and the, and the reasons that you, yeah. you you got into business in the first place. Um, and especially if you find that you're not enjoying your job anymore, what are you doing it for <laughs> it, to, to an extent? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I'm lucky enough that I absolutely love what I do, especially at the moment and, and with the changes in the market, it's a lot of exciting things going on. Whereas if I was running a business that potentially now would be 50, 60, 100 employees, Mm. I, I wouldn't be enjoying it, Gary. I wouldn't be, no. you know, sort no. of in the mix. And, it, and in many ways, then the, the balance is, would I be more successful or less successful? Depends what you, you know, would decide yeah. to, to term that as. So, yeah, yeah. yeah to, to answer the question in short, I think trust your instincts. And, and if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't, would be what I'd say to my to my younger self. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it'd be interesting when the kids do get to the point where they're coming into the business because, you know, why do they want to come into the business and what is it that's inspiring them to be part of the business is going to be important for them um, and for the future of the business as well. Absolutely. Mm, interesting. So just finally, is there, um, you know, we've got a community who watch the business spotlight on, on YouTube. Is there anything coming up, any offer or any event that's uh, coming up that you want to share with us? With Not them? as such. However, I, I think what would be worth me promoting or, or putting out there would be I'd be quite happy to jump on uh, a 30 minute call with, with, mm -hmm. with anyone with absolutely no pressure whatsoever from us or you know we don't, we don't sell our business mm -hmm. you know it's not how we do things just to give people advice if they're scratching their heads around their energy renewal or 
you know, that there's anything that they've got in terms of um, looking at potentially installing power generation on site, any question whatsoever. Um, so I suppose I'm, I'm selling my time, Gary, a little bit there to say, yeah. you know, if, if someone wants to, to pick up the phone to me or arrange a call, I'd be more than happy to do that. However, we facilitate that. Mm, um, right. Do you think that would be a value to people, Gary? Always, you know, I think in, in this market where there's a lot of choice, as you said, you know, thousands of people who do brokerage and uh, people are coming up to the end of fixed terms and things, why not? Why wouldn't it be sensible for them to have a chat with somebody who could perhaps, perhaps explore other ideas with them? So, no, appreciate that. Right. Um, so thanks very much, Louis. I mean, you know, I could chat for much longer, but it's great to get an insight into Cub and to you and to what you do and, and to hear some of those lessons um, really around the business success and, uh, and the teamwork stuff. That's that's really valuable. Thanks okay. very much for joining us on uh, on the Business Spotlight. My pleasure. Thanks, Gary.